This is a Global News special presentation. Live coverage of Federal Budget 2024. Here is Donna Friesen. Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the federal budget. Finance Minister Christian Freeland will lay out the government's fiscal plans for the coming year, where it intends to invest, how it intends to pay for it, and whether it will meet its own fiscal targets. And we will bring you all of the details. The budget is usually shrouded in secrecy before the big reveal in Parliament, which happens in just a few minutes. This time, though, there's a lot we already know because the Prime Minister has told us. He and other ministers have been on a cross-country tour doling out cash and making promises. We're going to create a Canadian Renters' Bill of Rights. There's a Tenants' Protection Fund, $15 million. One billion in low-cost loans, grants, and student loan forgiveness to expand childcare. A national school food program, one billion dollars. We all want kids to have the best start in life. A housing infrastructure fund, six billion. An apartment construction loan program, fifteen billion. We want to accelerate the pace of home construction. Support for the artificial intelligence sector and a new AI safety institute, two point four billion. To keep Canada and the world safer. And a promise to boost defense spending, $8.1 billion over the next five years. Total cost of these plus other promises, more than $37 billion. So that's what we already know. About $17 billion of that, I should say, is loan-based, so it's expected to come back to government coffers. But what we're waiting to see, to hear from the finance minister, are the plans to generate revenue. Some kind of wealth tax, possibly. That's what's been talked about in the last couple of days. We'll find out details of that shortly. Uh, there you see the finance minister and uh, the prime minister. Uh, I think uh, the finance minister is speaking. Let's listen in. Faster. We are making life cost less. We're driving the kind of economic growth that will ensure every generation of Canadians can reach their full potential. And we're making Canada's tax system more fair by ensuring that the very wealthiest pay their fair share. doing this because a fair chance to build a good middle class life, to do as well as your parents and grandparents, or better, has always been the promise of Canada. But today, millennial and Gen Z Canadians can get a good job. They can work hard. They can do everything their parents did and more. And too often, the reward remains out of reach. They look at their parents' lives and wonder, how will I ever be able to afford that? Hmm. The same anxiety haunts those of us who care about our younger generations, their parents and grandparents. What many parents have achieved for themselves, a degree of comfort and security, we want for our children and grandchildren. We want their hard work to be rewarded, as it has been for us. We want them to look forward to a future with a sense of anticipation, not angst. Nous sommes arrivés à un moment charnière pour les millennials et la génération Z. Ces gens ont un talent et un potentiel immense. Ils ont besoin de voir et de croire que notre pays peut fonctionner à leur avant. Hey, that's uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Finance Minister, Christian Freeland. She is now delivering the federal budget, which means we can reveal what's in it. Our reporters, including our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, has been in the budget lockup all day long and no joins us now. David, a heavy spending budget that was expected. Is there an overall theme that brings it together? Well, it is a scattershot budget uh, from a government that's behind in the polls, looking to have a little bit of something for everything. Uh, this is a 400-page document. It's stuffed with spending commitments, as I said, a little bit for everybody. But if there is a theme, Donna, it's this. It's a government that is trying to reach out to Canadians under the age of 45, and that would be your millennial and Generation Z voters. 
The first 80 pages of Budget 2024 details how the government will spur the construction of nearly 4 million new homes within seven years. We are building more homes at a pace and scale not seen since after the Second World War. Making it more affordable for Canadians, especially younger Canadians, to rent and to buy a new home. There is more than $8 billion worth of housing initiatives in the budget, which the government says is aimed at helping young Canadians achieve the middle-class dream of owning a home. You know, in terms of an outlay of resources, you know, another something in $8 billion approximately in new resources is, you know, is relatively ambitious in this environment where we're still running with elevated deficits and debt. But there's a host of other items clearly aimed at younger voters. $500 million, for example, set aside for a youth mental health fund. And Finance Minister Christopher Freeland repeated the commitment for free birth control pills through the National Pharmacare Plan. And there's some non-monetary items, like new rules to control the price of concert tickets by cracking down on fraudulent resellers, or bringing in a new right to disconnect, preventing your boss from texting or emailing you after hours. All the spending initiatives add up to $57 billion over five years, a third of which will be offset by an increase in capital gains taxes. I think the government you know, wanted to do this additional spending, so they looked at probably what would be the least offensive measures that they could implement in terms of uh, economic drawback. And Donna, you mentioned off the top, you, you showed some of the announcements already made on the spending side, and it's that capital gains exemption. That is the new, new thing that we're learning about today. That is, quote unquote, the wealth tax. There will still be capital gains exemptions for a lot of people. For instance, if you sell your principal residence, you don't pay any tax. Certain kinds of small businesses will continue to pay capital gains on the regular weight. But the government says there's 40,000 tax filers out there, 40,000 wealthy Canadians all, they are going to pay this increase in the capital gains tax, and those 40,000 people, the government is going to collect $19 billion off of them over the next five years. Donna. All right, David, just taking some notes there. Um, it, it, this government, as we know, is not doing particularly well in the polls. They're way behind the Conservatives, if you believe the polling right now. How do you think this budget might help them recover some political ground? It's going to be very difficult. The, the pollster uh, Shachi Curl from Angus Reid Institute today had, had a line I think it's useful to think about, that when the Liberals start to talk right now, a lot of Canadians, to keep using the Millennials, I guess, are putting on their AirPods and tuning right out. They're not hearing anything. This budget, though, is so thick with spending commitments. I mean, literally, there's, 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 there's a new right to disconnect rule that the government's going to introduce, which will give Millennials the right to tell their boss, don't text me or email me after hours. All sorts of little things in there that the government hopes some aspect of an electorate is going to grasp onto and hear the government's message and maybe start to appreciate them a bit more. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people might appreciate that right to disconnect, but I, 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 I'm curious about the detail because I just don't know how you legislate that. But David, what, is, what did you think is not in this budget? What might have some people expected to see that's not in there? Okay, there's a couple of things. One of the big things is, remember, the NDP are the Liberals' minority government partners. The NDP must support the government if it's going to pass, and I'm sure they will. There's some things in here that I think they're going to appreciate, but one of the things the NDP wanted was to tax grocery store chains, to tax oil and gas companies. They thought that's the way to go after what they say corporations are coming after people. There are no measures to increase, uh, increase taxes on corporations other than that capital gains tax. So that's not in the budget. We also heard, I think, uh, you know, there was a, some talk about getting pension funds, Canadian pension funds, forcing them to invest in Canadian companies. And there's no movement at this point so far on that. So those are a couple of things not there. We can also say there's no changes to your own personal income tax rate. It's not going up. It's not going down. And there's no changes to the GST. I always think that's important that for most Canadians, your tax environment, your Canada child benefit, all those things by and large staying the same. Okay, David Aiken, thanks. We'll check back in with you in a little bit. Federal budgets are big documents, and deciphering them does take some expertise. That's why it's great to have Kevin Page with us. He's an economist and was Canada's first parliamentary budget officer. He's also president and CEO of the University of Ottawa's Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy. Kevin, thanks for being with us. Can you start with your overall assessment of the, the wisdom and the prudence of this budget? So it's a big budget. Is um, 
you know, there's a lot of spending initiatives, initiatives that David has highlighted. Um, you know, fifty-seven billion dollars over five, six years. Uh, you know, some, that was a big tax initiative with respect to the change of the inclusion rate. Um, yeah, you know, again, I think one issue maybe David didn't highlight is the government is saying it, it can't commit to its targets, its deficit targets, which is very important. Forty, we're just under forty billion dollars this year, staying pretty flat next year. A modest decline in the outer years, uh, under one percent of GDP, but barely. So the government, I think, is, is is saying it could, you know, launch all these, you know, spending initiatives and still hold to its targets. Thanks in part to a little bit of a stronger economy, and uh, those the tax measure that David alluded to. Do you see that happening? Do you think the government, based on what you've seen, can stick to its fiscal targets given all this spending? Well, I think I think that I think there's if we get the soft landing that is assumed uh, in the outlook, and I think by all counts, I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption. The economy is going to grow in real terms just under one percent this year, about zero point seven percent, which is up a little bit from what we thought last fall. Uh, that'll give the government a little bit more revenues. Um, I think really where the risks are with respect to targets is in the outer years. Um, I think it's, there's really no prudence built in. There's no reserves effectively built into those outer year targets. So the, the you know the margin you know the room to maneuver is quite narrow. I mean I think it's going to be a difficult 2025 budget in this environment if we get the outlook that's assumed. Can you help us understand uh, the increase in capital gains? Uh, David said 40,000 Canadians will end up paying it, and that will amount to about 19 billion dollars. Is that, I assume, annually? Um, we, we're, no, no, that's that, actually over, over five years. Over five years. Okay, that's important. And um, so, how, so we were expecting something uh, that would target the wealthy. Do you think that this capital gains uh, increase does target the, the 1% or the 0.1%, the extreme wealthy in this country? Yeah, I think it, it targets uh, individuals but, uh, and corporations. So the corporations are also going to feel the pinch from the change to this rule. And um, yeah, actually, you know, I think it'll be a little bit disrupted this year. This me- measure is, is, is going to go in in about three months time towards the end of June. I think you're going to see a lot of people trying to cash in as well uh, under the current regime for tax exe- uh, capital gains exemptions. Um, I think, like business community, I don't think they're going to be too happy with this measure. I think they're going to say that they, you know, they need that the, you know, those revenues uh, in order to put back into to grow investment. We need more investment in this economy to boost productivity. Um, so I think it's yeah, it's it's a you know, it's going to be a controversial measure. I th- I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of negativity from the business community over the next 24 hours. So who is the government targeting with that increase in capital gains? Well, I think it's it's targeting very wealthy individuals, but also corporations uh, uh, as well. And I think the business community will say we need both of those to put to plug put the money back in on investment. You know, there are some measures in here uh, designed to help the lives uh, help make the lives of Canadians better. As David said, no tax increases on the middle class. What do you think is the overall narrative the government is trying to achieve with this budget? Well, they're shifting the narratives, uh, Donna. Like you know, the narratives in the past budgets are growing the middle class. Now they're they're talking more about you know a, a generational type of fairness, uh, trying to help young people get into homes, uh, young people that are dealing potentially with mental health issues. There's a lot of resources, uh, you know, for First Nations people, particularly children and families that you know that are struggling as well. I think so. They're trying to find a balance in this kind of low growth environment. Uh, there's some monies there, like that, just you know, to support um, you know, research, uh, innovation, uh, you know, AI in particular. Um, that will start to flow. It's it's a relatively small amount. It probably will, hopefully, we'll see more of that in the 2025 budget. And Kevin, were you expecting to see some sort of windfall tax on excess profits, the so-called Galen Weston tax? Yeah, I think that was ru- rumored, Don. I think it's that's not that's a very difficult tax to implement. I think uh, the finance officials, I'm sure, that were probably you know talking behind the scenes. To, you know, the Minister Freeland and the Prime Minister probably say, if, if we're going to we, if we need revenues, we don't want to tax consumption, we don't want to tax the middle class. This is probably our best bet. Let's change the capital gains exemption. Um, I think an excess profit tax would be very difficult to implement. Kevin Page, uh, good to have you with us. Thanks for your insight. All right, I think we're going to uh, Abigail Beeman, who has uh, 
Oh, apologies. Before we do that, we're going to give you a little bit of a, a bit of a highlight of what uh, we've already heard in the budget. Some of the takeaways. The Sears budget is promising fairness for every generation. Unsurprisingly, there's a clear focus on solving the housing crisis. Uh, we already knew that with the advance uh, ad announcements the government has made. There's a pledge to turbocharge home construction across the country. The government says its plan would see nearly 4 million homes built in the next seven years, and that would be at a cost of more than $8 billion. This is a budget heavy on spending. It has set aside $57 billion in new money for more than 200 additional measures. And to pay for all that new spending, the government is setting its sights on the country's wealthiest with a plan to increase taxes on capital gains of the top 0.1% of Canadians. Well, Canada has a long-standing poor record on productivity. The pandemic made it worse, and it hasn't improved since, though it has in the U.S. Canada, for some reason, is still stuck, and lots of economists have been sounding the alarm because higher productivity helps the economy generate wealth for everyone. Abigail Beeman has been looking through the budget at how to tackle that problem. Abigail. Three times, and the government says the need to boost it has never been greater. But experts question whether the moves in this budget will actually work. With construction robots, Promise Robotics is at the crossroads of the housing crisis and AI and understands the value in investing in productivity. What's a dollar per square foot you spend? And like a holistic view and start to look at how this will you can monetize over the years, then you've got a pretty good business case to be able to actually invest in your productivity. But many businesses are hesitant to invest, part of the complex web of declining productivity, with other factors including a large increase in immigration and global tensions. That is the one metric that keeps dropping on us year after year after year. And it does impact people and how they feel they're doing, quite frankly. In Ontario now, people make the same as they make in Alabama. We're falling behind all G7 countries. We're falling behind the United States. And in Finland, they make the same as us. They work less. So they're working smarter. You know those signs that say, in an emergency, break the glass? Well... It's time to break the glass. That's the senior deputy governor of the Bank of Canada in a recent speech talking about our productivity problem. To explain what productivity really means, Carolyn Rogers used a very Canadian analogy. The same number of workers working the same number of hours will clear more snow with solid shovels that don't break. They'll be even more productive if given snow blowers. But for the most cleared driveways, invest in snow plows. Budget 2024 promises about $7 billion to boost productivity, the bulk going to AI and research investments. But will it work? Productivity is such a difficult nut to crack. For this economist says the measures are good to see, especially around post-secondary research, but may be counteracted by a different budget measure. It's not helpful to necessarily see capital gains taxation at this exact moment. With some businesses already nervous about increasing investments in this economy, experts warn having to pay more will certainly not act as an incentive. Donna? All right, Abigail Beeman, thank you. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson is with me. Mercedes, you've been listening as I have to uh, the details as they've emerged from the budget lockup. Uh, what strikes you most about this budget? Well, Donna, the name of it really struck me. It's fairness for every generation. It used to be fairness for the middle class, and I think that really speaks to the concern the Liberals have about young voters who traditionally voted Liberal experiencing this frustration with the cost of living, the fear that they'll never own a home, and trying to really draw those millennials and Gen Z voters back into the Liberal tent. The focus on housing, the focus on little things like work hours that David mentioned, where if you work in a federally regulated industry, not if you work anywhere else, you will now theoretically be able to say no to your boss contacting you after hours. That's a very Gen Z kind of thing to bring in. Uh, and so I think this is really something that's trying to appeal to some of their political weaknesses. Uh, it's a lot of smaller programs that are directed at accomplishing the same goals, trying to do what they think they can to make life more affordable. And I think the big question will be how much of this kicks in or makes a significant difference before the next election? And of course, what happens with inflation? 
inflation overall. Because if it comes down, that will help the Liberals going into that next election. If it continues to go up and changes the trend that it's on now, which thankfully is downward, that could create much larger challenges for them. Yeah, if inflation goes down, it helps everyone, right? And then logically follows that uh, interest rates will drop down too, and that'll do something to the incredible amount of mortgage debt that uh, people hold across this country. Mercedes, um, is I'm curious about the two things, the this um, getting getting your boss not to contact you after hours. I mean, that to me seems like a change in labor law. I don't even know how you do that. I'm curious to find out. Uh, also, yeah, David very curious mentioned too. Yeah, free birth control. Yes, free birth control. So this is something they've been telegraphing in advance of the budget. They were talking about diabetes drugs and birth control as two things that'll be the first sort of planks of the National Pharmacare Plan that they promised to the NDP. And it hasn't been as clear what's going to happen with the diabetes drugs. Those are very, very expensive, uh, and it's very difficult in particular for low-income Canadians to often afford those drugs. Birth control is sort of the government making uh, a statement politically. As we see women's rights being walked back in the U.S. and we see abortion laws changing, there's been a lot of concern about birth control as well. This is not just about making birth control more affordable, which certainly is a target for this government, uh, and it can be quite expensive, especially for young women who the burden falls on disproportionately, if you're talking about hormonal birth control, uh, to be able to afford. But it's also a way of making a political statement by the Trudeau government about where they stand uh, on women's rights, where they stand on women's health issues. I think free birth control is already something that's available in British Columbia, and I think uh, there was a lot of hope that other provinces would pick that up. Mercedes, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, there was lots of talk about a windfall tax. Um, certainly there's been a, a big push for that in some circles, a windfall tax on excess wealth, particularly by the grocery store chains. We haven't seen that. And there's always been a talk that you can't do that because capital will flee, that capital will just leave the country. They won't stay. They don't want to pay more tax. What, how do you think the government has handled this? Well, it's been interesting because they've done such, as you say, Donna, basically a 180 on this. They were sort of testing the messaging of we're going to go after the rich, the big grocery store CEOs. We're going to hold them accountable. Francois-Philippe Champagne came out and insisted he was making progress back at Thanksgiving. Well, there has been some progress in food prices dropping, but that's been as a result of what's happening with the economy and with inflation and with interest, not because the government has been taking particular action. There is not a windfall tax in here on either grocery stores or the oil and gas industry, two of the industries that I was hearing a lot of rumbling about. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke with the Environment Minister, Stephen Guilbeault, on the West Block, and he told me at that time that essentially they were not looking at putting more taxes on oil and gas because they believed it would cause capital flight and that it would potentially cause those oil and gas companies to actually pull out of Canada completely and go to jurisdictions where they would not have to pay a higher carbon tax or higher windfall taxes. So the government seems to have backed away from that. It'll be interesting to see how the NDP reacts to it. Uh, but a lot of analysts have said, look, if you increase the taxes in particular on grocery stores, it will just get passed on to consumers anyhow. It's not necessarily a way to make things less expensive. It's a way to generate government revenue, which is something very different. Yeah, I think the idea was a tax not on the grocery store per se, but a tax on the massive profits that the grocery store makes. But nonetheless, exactly. it's not happening. So Mercedes Stevenson, uh, thank you. We're going to come back to you in a little bit. Um, let's go now to Francis Fong uh, to look at some of the finer points in today's budget. He's a senior economist at TD Economics. He was also in the lockup today, combing through all the details of the budget. Thanks for joining us, Francis. What stood out to you? Yeah, I think we've heard a lot about this. I think the, the, the capital gains inclusion rate really was what stood out. I, I think a lot of us were, were anticipating a relatively thin budget, c given the kind of economic environment we're in. And so it was, I, I think, perhaps what I'll say kind of uh, uh, interesting to see the government kind of put forth a number of initiatives aimed at raising productivity, focusing on AI, research in post-secondary institutions, venture capital, all things that should notionally move the needle a little bit on what is a pretty negative productivity growth story here in Canada. Canada. And yet when you add on this capital gains inclusion rate story, I think that was probably the kind of uh, area where we would have liked a little bit more clarity from government as to what they're specifically aiming for in this budget. Well, the theme of the budget, there always is one. This time it's fairness for every generation, which sounds fantastic. Uh, does this measure up to that? I think Mercedes kind of alluded to this, that there being kind of more of a focus on perhaps younger voters. It, it would have been all well and good if you had taken a higher capital gains inclusion rate, which government estimates is really going, only going to impact 
0.13% of, of the top earning Canadians with an average income of over 1.4 million, mind you. So really a very small proportion of, uh, of folks are going to get hit by this. Uh, but on the same token, it would have been interesting to see whether they would have taken that money and maybe redistributed it, maybe lower taxes on middle income Canadians. But instead we saw most of the focus on spending initiatives, housing, national defense, uh, indigenous reconciliation. So, so on the fairness side, really what we've seen is really more revenue raising uh, in the hopes of kind of funding a lot of spending initiatives that they really hope will move the needle on some of these core issues that are important to Canadians. So revenue generating rather than redistributing, rev generating and then redistributing. Francis, last year's budget had a big focus on the green economy, which is a top issue among a lot of young people especially. Was there anything in this budget aimed at reducing emissions? Definitely a lot less, Donna, than we've seen in past budgets. Uh, not to say there was nothing. I think the big question coming into this was how will the government respond to political pushback against the federal fuel charge or the carbon tax, if you will. Uh, and that was something that I think was sort of answered in that we got some details about how small businesses are going to get their rebates this time, something government's been talking about for quite some time. But the fact that they put out those details uh, really, I think, solidifies that this is going to be a central piece of their climate platform heading into next year's election. Outside of that, I think the big piece was really this, this new kind of EV supply chain tax credit that's on top of the previous tax credit, uh, tax credits that we've seen announced in previous budgets and fall economic statements. Again, sort of solidifying that government is doubling down on, on the clean economy as a source of future growth. Okay, Francis Fong uh, from uh, TD Economics. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Donna. Let's go back to Mercedes and David in the foyer of the House of Commons. David, there's always a balancing act when the finance minister has to deliver a budget. We know that. Um, you know, spending to help people cope with the cost of living, but not so much that it drives up inflation. Also, there's a bit of politics in here. Some would say a lot of politics. Do you think yeah. that Christia Freeland uh, got it right? Well, uh, we're going to find out. I mean, really, that's in the eye of the NDP, for one thing, and, of course, Conservatives who won't like this budget. Just to pick on one thing that Francis Fong said about the carbon tax, there is a lot of language about carbon rebates, right? Because the government very much likes to stress the idea that it's a carbon rebate that goes with the carbon tax. And here's something for small business owners. And I was speaking to Dan Kelly of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, and he's been pushing for this for two years. The government is sending a carbon rebate to small businesses in those provinces that there is the federal backstop. So that's basically Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Atlantic Canada, and so on. It's two and a half billion dollars is coming back to small business. So that's a big win for the CFIB and small business owners. And one other thing when we talk about things that there was a lot of cross-party support for, boosting the Canada Disability Tax Benefit. That is in the budget. It's six billion dollars over the next five years. It's going to top up uh, what you may be getting already from a provincial program. And there have been a lot of support for that. And you talk about politics, my sense, given all the spending projects in here, just about everybody at the cabinet table probably looking at the electoral clock saying, we've only got a year left, folks. Uh, we want to get something done. And Carla Qualtro, uh, the um, uh, MP from Delta, BC, she's the Minister for Disabled Benefits. I think she pushed for that and she got it. All right, David, thanks. Mercedes, a couple of quick wrapped up, wrapping up thoughts from you on, on uh, the political calculation in this budget. Well, I'm really interested to see, Donna, where this all goes politically with the opposition. We just heard from Jugmeet saying he says he doesn't know whether or not he's going to support this budget yet. He's disappointed that he says it didn't do enough to tackle corporate greed. While well, at the same time, we're hearing from some economists that they're concerned about the effect of those capital gains taxes. So we'll have to see how this budget all plays with Canadians, which at the end of the day is what the Liberals are really looking to as they head towards an election in 2025. All right, Mercedes Stevenson, thanks. Thanks to you and David. Aiken, Francis Fong, and Kevin Page. Before we end our live special this afternoon, here again some highlights of today's budget. Housing was front and center, $8.5 billion to build nearly 4 million new homes by 2031. Federal government also pledging billions for social programs, including $1.5 billion to launch Canada's National Pharmacare program and a billion dollars for a new national school food program. To help pay for that, the government spend, plans to raise more than $18 billion by hiking capital gains taxes on Canada's wealthiest 0.1%. 
For our viewers across the global television network, our coverage concludes now. However, if you're watching us on BC One or on any of our streaming platforms, please stay with us. Our coverage will continue in just a moment. And coming up on Global National tonight, I'll have full analysis of the budget and I will speak with the Finance Minister, Christia Freeland. For now, I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Budget 2024 coverage continues now. Here's a look at the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, where Finance Minister Christian Freeland has just presented the federal budget, the big focus on affordability and the housing crisis. But if you're worried about your bosses emailing you at night, well, there's something for you in the budget. If you're worried around being scammed by a ticket company, well, there's something for you in the budget, all an attempt to try to get the younger generation to vote Liberal in the next federal election. I'm Richard Zussman. From one capital to another, I'm here at the legislature in Victoria, where there is no bigger issue than housing and affordability. We'll get into all of that as we dissect the budget. But first, I want you to have a listen to Federal Finance Minister Krista Freeland. We're making it easier for Canadian homeowners to add a basement suite or a laneway house so middle class Canadians can be part of the housing solution too. Mr. Speaker, our work to build more homes faster across our country is quite literally an exercise in nation building, a true Team Canada effort. Together, we are putting into action a plan to build nearly 4 million homes by 2031 and to unlock the door to the middle class for more young Canadians. Pendant que nous travaillons de toute urgence à augmenter l'offre de logement, Notre gouvernement prend des mesures pour soulager le fardeau des Canadiens et Canadiens, particulièrement celui des jeunes Canadiens, en rendant la location ou l'achat du nouveau logement plus abordable. Nous commençons par mieux protéger les locataires contre les fortes hausses de loyer et les rénovations. Nous veillons aussi à ce que les paiements de loyer qu'ils versent à temps améliorent leur crédit. Ils seront ainsi mieux placés pour obtenir une prête hypothécaire, peut-être à un taux plus bas, lorsque viendra le temps d'acheter leur première maison. Time buyers, we will be extending the maximum amortization period of a mortgage to 30 years mm -hmm. on new builds, mm -hmm. including condos. That means lower monthly payments and greater opportunity for young people to get those first keys of their own. Combined with tax-free ways to save for a first down payment through the tax-free first home savings account and the enhanced home buyers plan, the longer amortization period will ensure more younger Canadians are able to afford that first home <coughs> and take that next big step into a prosperous middle class life. Christian Freeland is Canada's finance minister. For more on this, let's bring in Global's chief political correspondent, David Aiken. So, David, obviously the biggest thing here is the fact that our boss, Mike Henniger, can't email us after hours. But beyond that, what do you make of the spending built into this budget? 
Yeah, there's a whole bunch of spending in this budget. It's 400 pages thick, and it is stuffed with spending commitments. We were talking to some economists in our lockup today, and, and they were saying it's a real tax and spending budget. So uh, a lot of the spending commitments you've already heard about. The government spent the last three weeks touring the country, dropping into Vancouver a lot of times to announce a lot of spending on how to build more homes. We're going to see $8 billion in spending over the next five years. Um, on programs to build homes, but also $10 billion in spending, new spending on defense. We're going to see $6.5 billion on new health programs, um, uh, and so on down the list. Overall, $57 billion in new spending, uh, and then there's some of these non-monetary items. You just mentioned one where the government's going to bring in a, a rule called a right to disconnect. So your boss can't text you or email you after work. Uh, that may be important. One of the key themes for this, Richard, as you know, is trying to target millennial and Generation Z voters. That don't let my boss get me is, is one of those. Um, you know, we saw a lot of people, I think when Taylor Swift came to Vancouver, people were concerned that I was getting gouged on ticket fees and, and fraud sellers. There's going to be new rules to help those who want to go to rock concerts uh, avoid some extra fees. So a lot of little things that the government hopes attracts millennial and Gen Z voters, in addition to those big ticket items, on trying to make houses more, more affordable and more available. Yeah, budgets are always framed in terms of what do they give Canadians and what will that mean for voting. But there was also a promise from the finance minister leading into this that we would not see a big blow up of the budget, an increase here. Was she successful doing that when you look through these pages of the budget? She is going to argue that she is. The deficit is around $40 billion right now. And don't forget the overall spending, uh, we're spending $450 billion a year. So the deficit is around uh, $40 billion. And it's going to sort of stay around that level over the next five years. I mentioned there's $57 billion in new spending. How does that happen? By And the deficit's not going to grow very much. A couple of things. First, the government is betting on the economy growing. As the economy grows, so does tax revenue. As we see high inflation, believe it or not, the government benefits from high inflation uh, in terms of their revenues. And the other big news that was not, tell well, it was telegraphed to a degree, but the big news is where is some other money coming from? And that is a capital gains tax on the wealthiest of us. The government is going to increase the capital gains tax. It says it's paid by about 40,000 tax filers. And those 40,000 tax filers are going to pay a cumulative $19 billion over the next five years. So that is, that is big. A lot of business groups are already saying that is going to be a disincentive for new investment. You might find some you know, entrepreneurs who had a very successful business want to cash out and start another business up, um, but they're going to have to pay a steep price now on the capital gains they make from cashing out uh, that business. So that is the big thing that helps Christian Freeland maintain that fiscal guardrail. She's got some new spending, but she's offsetting that with a major new tax, new tax increase on capital gains. No other tax increases, no income tax increase, no GST increase, et cetera. Just at that high end, which the government sa says will affect a very small number of very wealthy tax filers. It's always an easy target, David, you know that, to go after the most wealthy Canadians. There's the perception that you know they are already making enough, that going to them for a little bit can help. But as you alluded to, there are some spin-off effects of that. It could have a greater impact on our economy. It could make Canada a less desirable place for people to invest. What sort of concerns, beyond the ones you mentioned, are you hearing about targeting the richest Canadians when it comes to supplementing all the new spending. Well, and that, that's it. You just sort of hit it. We heard from everybody from the former Bank of Canada to Governor David Dodge to any number, the, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, lots of business groups hearing that there was going to be some sort of wealth tax had telegraphed their concerns about this. Uh, and, and as they say, they say, the more you tax the profits from investment, the less people in this country are going to want to invest. And of course, uh, people from abroad, the less interest there will be in uh, foreign investment coming to the country. Again, the finance minister has some answers to that. She's ready to defend that. She says compared to other jurisdictions, uh, it is still in line historically in Canada. She says it is still below other levels. So we'll see. One thing that small businesses, I think, are going to be happy about is a, the carbon tax rebate. Now, unfortunately, this is not going to happen in British Columbia. Yeah. It's only in those jurisdictions where the federal carbon tax and rebate programs in effect. So that's Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and so on. But the government is going to turn $2.5 billion back to small businesses eligible uh, for the carbon tax rebate. And again, I say, not in BC. 
This may put a little pressure perhaps on Premier Eby, of course, to say, you know, how are British Columbians benefiting uh, in terms of any carbon tax rebate that a whole lot of other people in the rest of the country are benefiting from? Well, when you were in lockup, David, Premier David Eby was asked about exactly that this morning. And one of the things he said is there are already programs here in BC to offset the increase that we saw in the carbon tax at the beginning of the month. The province is doing a number of things, including rebates through BC Hydro. So I think the Premier already has his answer set up for that. And we know that all governments use budgets as a launching point for elections. We don't know when the next federal election will be, but what is your sense in terms of how this will land with voters? And is this what the Liberals need to help shake up the polls as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau continues to trail uh, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev basically across the board when it comes to popularity? You know, it's a great question, Richard, and it's perhaps the $450 billion question for the folks in the House of Commons beside me. You know, Shachi Kuro, the pollster from Angus Reid Institute, she had a column that we read in the Ottawa Citizen this morning, and she had a good line saying, right now, no matter what Prime Minister Trudeau talks about, it's as though those millennials have stuck the noise-canceling AirPods into their ears. They're just not listening. And so one assumes that this budget also has the political value that there's so many little things in it. They're free contraception. We're going to get that through National Pharmacare. I know that BC has already sort of led the way in that, but those, this, the, the idea of a right to disconnect, there's so many little points that the government hopes it will break through, that millennial and Gen Z voters will see something, they'll start paying a little more attention to what the Trudeau government is doing, and in that sense, the Trudeau government can begin to resuscitate their fortunes. Uh, I'm not sure about that, we'll see. Typically, ministers will now dispatch themselves to the rest of the country and start talking up some of the programs, and you're certain to see them talking to the Vancouver Chamber of Commerce, to boards of trade, to community clubs over the next uh, uh, coming days. All right, David, thanks so much. I hope they fed you well in lockup, and we'll talk soon. We are anxiously awaiting hearing from some of the opposition leaders. We will get to them soon. But for more analysis, we go back uh, to Ottawa in the lockup room. Uh, Kevin Page was the first parliamentary budget officer in this country. He's now at the University of Ottawa. Kevin, thank you so much for doing this. And, and what do you make of what we've seen presented here uh, by Finance Minister Christian Freeland? Yeah, <clears throat> good to be with you, Richard. I thought David did a great job, you know, providing that, you know, the overall summary. Um, it you know, definitely kind of has a feel of an election budget, just the sheer size of it. You know, the amount of spending, $57 billion over the next five, six years. Uh, just, you know, the, the number of initiatives. David said 400 pages, but I counted the, the number of moving line items. There's like, like 200 different moving line items in the budget. Six big priorities. Uh, and some of this is front end loaded. I mean, you, when, when one looks Carefully, 2024-25, you see a big increase in program spending, like something like in the neighborhood of from 450 to 480 billion dollars uh, from 2023-24 to this year. Um, you know, a lot of new initiatives that are starting to kick in in 2024-25, and also that tax measure kicks in starting in the in, in the summer, you know, mid to late June. So, just a lot of busyness in the budget, a lot of moving parts, but a, a busy year in 2024-25 as well. You mentioned big document, lots of moving pieces, but often what's as important as what's in the budget is what's not in the budget. What did you make in terms of what was not included in terms of what Christopher Freeland laid out today? Yeah, so I think like for them, the fiscal watchers that will probably say what was not included was like more focused to try to to, uh, to reduce government spending. A lot of criticisms, just the, the sheer increase in the government over yeah, the past, he's, he's since here. 2015 really. And I think, you know, as well, so, but we didn't really see additional spending restraint. The government chose in the middle of a relatively weak economy to increase taxes, uh, to go after capital gains, you know, and there are a lot of talk in the, in the past number of months, really, about we, how we're losing ground relative to the Americans, to the OECD in general with respect to productivity. So, and this is not going to help productivity. So, um, you know, what was missing maybe was a more of an effort, to, you know, to reduce, you know, some of the spending and, um, you know, and I think, you know, maybe this is something we have to look to 2000, budget 2025. And, and you mentioned productivity. 
When we see these significant tax increases to wealthiest, economists always say, well, it will mean that we lose out on people going elsewhere. And often, when Canadians look at options, they look south of the border to the United States. Are there any thoughts here, Kevin, about the impact that taxing the wealthiest could have on driving those who make the most here to do work in the United States? That Canada may not be as lucrative a place for them to do business as it has been in the past. Yeah, I think I think there's um, there's the impact to the actual measure in terms of dollars, the way it's been calculated by finance. But then there's there's the kind of the confidence signaling impact that comes when you signal that you're going to uh, to be raising uh, taxes that are going to impact wealthy people and, and corporations. Like again, that change to the cap, the capital gains exclusion that has a bigger impact even on corporations than it does have on on wealthy individuals. And then again, it kicks in very soon. The goal here always, I think, with this government has been to target the middle class. They're now changing the language a little bit around targeting generations. Do you think there's an effectiveness here in terms of the way in which the budget is targeting? And, and is it realistic to believe that a budget like this can profoundly impact cost of living? You know, we know here in BC it's having a deep and profound impact on so many. We know it's happening across the country. Like, are there things here that make you believe that they have finally, I guess, hit the nail on the head when it comes to addressing those real significant needs in terms of cost of living and affordability? Yeah, so this is, I mean, a big Canadian issue. This is um, what I'm sure all Canadian politicians are, are hearing. It's a, it's a global issue as well. It's, you know, the OECD countries are experiencing affordability stressors. Have we hit the mark? I would say probably not. I think this is, you know, we've seen measure after measure really since two, the 2021 budget to kind of address the affordability concerns. So yeah, these price levels, they're still biting consumers. Um, the big, I think in this budget, I think the, you know, the additional monies that are going to go to, to boost housing supply over the next few years, that'll start, you know, hopefully bring down uh, some of these, you know, the, 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 the housing prices and just make it a little bit more affordable for Canadians to enter the market. Yeah, and I think that's the goal of all governments. You know, we see here an intense focus in BC around uh, getting those homes built to decrease price, but it's challenging. There are so many things involved there. We have a workforce in this country that is almost tapped out and struggling to get homes built. Uh, there are challenges with supply chains. One of the issues, you know this better than I do with budgets, they get presented once a year, there's an intense focus, and then we don't really hear you know, that concrete a plan until next year. What are you going to be watching for, in essence, between now and budget 2025, in terms of whether we're starting to see some indicators change to show that this is effectively uh, reaching the goals that this government is hoping it will? Yeah, so Richard, I think we'll watch a few things just to, with respect to housing. One, we want to see these authorities passed uh, by Parliament, and then we want to see, like, you know, is that money flowing uh, to provinces, to municipalities, to households, to construction companies? I think, you know, secondly, we'll, kind of, we'll be looking at housing starts, building permits to see, are they continuing to ramp up? So there's a lot to focus on between now and 2025. Kevin, thank you so much for doing this. Pleasure to be with you, Richard. Kevin Page was Canada's first parliamentary budget officer. He is now at the University of Ottawa. All right, you can't be in front of the legislature without my friend Keith Baldry. Uh, so Keith Baldry is here now with me. So Keith, you've had a look at mm -hmm. the budget here in Ottawa. It's going to make a difference for people here in BC and across the country. What are your sort of first takes about what you saw here? Well, again, the budget was essentially leaked or distributed before today. We knew about the big spending. We knew about the, the housing program. We knew about, well, it had been published reports about the tax on the Wealthiest people earn more than two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. Targeted taxes for corporations, uh, big increase in terms of capital gains taxes. Housing, I think, is the big thing. David Eby today uh, at an event talked about the number one goal for the BC government's perspective was more money for housing. So we saw a number of measures announced today: longer amortization uh, periods to thirty years to attract more first-time home buyers into the market, uh, freeing up more public land for housing construction, bigger write-offs for housing builders. So there's a lot of incentives in this budget to build housing, but it is a classic tax and spend budget. As, as, you know, I found it interesting David Aiken's comments that uh, it's in the, the Liberals' uh, 
interest, necessity to attract the Generation Z and uh, millennials. They've lost the millennials in some of the recent polling. They need to get them back. That's why they were even you were joking about our bosses no longer, uh, you know, be, being connected with us after hours. So that's purely a play at young workers. So there's a lot of sort of measures in here, small ones, but interesting ones aimed at attracting younger voters. I know they will always be able to find me on this <laughs> no, thing. No yeah. matter what I rules no they are, about this. <laughs> we will be found. <laughs> One of the things they've learned here in BC is you can say in the budget, we're going to build all this housing, we're going to put all this mm -hmm. money in, but finding the people to do the work yeah. is proving to be very problematic. And, and you mentioned Premier Eby spoke this morning. One of the other interesting things he said is if other provinces don't want to meet the criteria that Ottawa has set mm -hmm. out, well, BC will happily take the yep. money because the province here has outlined plans to build that housing, whereas there's been resistance from places like Ontario to see the sort of density they are working on here. What challenges are you looking at here that Ottawa may face when it comes to just the idea of, yes, the money's coming to the provinces, but how do you measure if it's successful or not? So they've had a very ambitious target, 3.9 million homes over the next few years, a huge number of in terms of new construction, but you hit the nail on the head right at the beginning. Who's going to build these homes? We have a shortage of trained workers in construction and a number of other resources, resource sectors as well. And there's only so many workers out there that can build these houses. But I found EB's comments that you point out very intriguing, saying if Ontario and Alberta, who are the most two most notable opponents of what the Trudeau government is trying to do, if they don't want to be par participate in this, we'll gladly uh, step in and take whatever can come our way. We haven't been able to fully look at this, these books yet. Uh, for those watching, you may know that you know you go into a budget lockup. David Aiken, our other colleagues, Mercedes Stevenson, Abigail Beeman, have all looked through the documents. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that opportunity yet. But one of the things that all premiers have been asking for is more money when it comes to infrastructure. And with more houses comes a pressure yep. on our network. You need more hospitals, more schools, more roadways. Here in BC specifically, the future of the Massey Tunnel, the Highway 1 widening. You know, knowing that you haven't been able to get fully through this, but we also have to assume there is money here for infrastructure. How crucial is it from Ottawa to send that message saying, we are here at the table ready to be a partner to build that that we know uh, is going to be needed because of the pressure that immigration and other things are putting on so the system. So infrastructure is probably the Premier's joint collective number one issue next to healthcare. And they've been ringing this bell for some time because the massive immigration numbers is really putting pressure on the need for more infrastructure, whether it's schools and hospitals, it literally, literally things like replacing municipal sewer pipes because there's many more people living in that particular area. And housing needs to be hooked up to electricity, needs to be hooked up to utilities and sewer. And that involves money. And the municipalities and province don't have all that money in, in able to afford this type of pressure that comes from such a massive population increase. So you're right, we haven't looked at the fine print because we're not in the lockup. Lucky us. Um, but, um, we had to pay for a lunch. Yeah, exactly. So in, for infrastructure, uh, BC's number one priority, aside from housing, was the Massey Tunnel Replacement yeah. Project. And they've really been at the table with Ottawa demanding, or at least asking Ottawa to participate. I haven't seen it on some of the shorthand uh, Canadian press uh, wire service list of all the goodies in the budget. So it makes me think the Massey Tunnel's not in there. Yeah, and that's one of the things that obviously matters a lot here. I know across the country there are infrastructure concerns from our own. Keith, thanks so much. We continue to get reaction coming in here. Let's hear from the first of the opposition leaders, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. I'm never going to be able to buy a home. Forget that. I don't even know if I can afford to rent a home. When the average rent in major cities in our country uh, is for a two-bedroom apartment upwards of $3,000 a month, how is some, someone supposed to afford that? and still have money left over to pay the bills and be able to buy groceries. So it is a very serious concern that people have that just you know, 10, 20 years ago, maybe even further, 40 years ago, people could afford to buy a home on their salary, on, their, on the, working one job. And now people working very good jobs, multiple jobs, are saying there's no way for us to even afford rent and all the other bills that we have. So this budget does not address that, but specifically because the Liberals failed to address the major reason why things are so expensive, that's corporate greed. They did not take the opportunity to take on uh, corporate greed with the wealth tax on the excess profits of oil and gas companies, of corporate grocery store companies that are making record profits. So they chose not to do that. Frankly, the Conservatives would never do this either. And New Democrats really were the only party committed to taking on the real cause that is driving up the cost of living. Is this a budget you will support? 
So uh, that's not a decision that we are making right now. Um, and the reason for that is the following. While we fought for certain things in the budget that, we, that are very important, that are going to give relief to people, uh, we have some serious concerns. And I want to hear from the Prime Minister what his plan is to address those concerns. What is his plan to address the fact that we're losing, well, his budget's going to cut 5,000 public sector employees. How does he ensure that we're still going to get good service for Canadians? What is the plan to ensure that Indigenous communities that for so long have not received adequate funding for infrastructure and housing, what's the plan to close that gap? What's the plan to address the fact that $500 or, or $200 a month for people living with disabilities is insufficient? What is the plan to address those concerns? So I want to hear that from the Prime Minister uh, before we make a decision. Any concern on the debt charges, sir? I mean, we're seeing taxpayers are going to be paying a lot more to service debt, and that's going to raise some questions about what they're getting in service. Is that a concern for you as you call for more spending? So we've long raised the concerns that this Liberal government should be cutting spending when it comes to billions of dollars in sub uh, subsidies to oil and gas companies. We can't afford that. They should be cutting the hundreds of millions of dollars they spend on private consultants. We've said that they should have cut the Conservative uh, corporate handout, which to date has resulted in $60 billion of money in their pockets, money taken out of Canadians' pockets. So there are significant things that we would do differently to ensure that we are actually being very responsible with our spending, that we are actually making sure that the super rich pay their fair share, that we are not wasting money on subsidies to profitable oil and gas companies. And that's billions of dollars of subsidies that are being wasted in that way. So we wouldn't do these things that the Liberals are doing. There's one contrast that's very clear. While I've identified it again and again, the reason why your groceries are high, the reason why your cell phone bills are high, the reason why you can't afford housing is corporate greed. And the Liberals are failing to address that. And the Conservatives won't do that either. The Conservatives and the Liberals are far too close to wealthy CEOs and big corporations to take on the real reason why your cost of living is so high. That's a contrast. It's clear to me that the Liberals and nor, nor the Conservatives are ever going to address that. You'll need new Democrats to address that problem. So but in terms of, but in terms of, is that what you're saying? But in terms of the specific question, uh, we, I need to hear a plan from the, from the Prime Minister. What is his plan to respond to the concerns that I have before we make a decision? Welcome back. Keith uh, joins me again. So we know we've seen minority governments here in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Minority governments need partners. They need support in budgets. Jagmeet Singh was asked about it. What is the sense you get from him in terms of will he continue to support this government and keep Justin Trudeau in power? He's got no choice. I mean, if an election were held today, if he were to force an election, he'd be annihilated in terms of seats across the country. He'd be lucky to hang on his own seat in Burnaby South. So he keeps drawing these lines in the sand, but they turn out to be invisible. And no one can actually see them. So he just heard his encounter asked several times by reporters. He wants to take a look at this. He wants to talk to the Prime Minister about the concerns. So he was looking for much more uh, heavier tax burden on corporations, uh, much more uh, measures to help affordability impoverished Canadians and such. It wasn't there to his satisfaction. But he sounded the, the warnings before. I'm, I'm going to pull my support in less and less and less. He can't follow through on it because he's basically playing with an, uh, his gun that has no bullets in it. And it, again, I don't expect him to deny support because of this budget. And we know at a federal level, the NDP has often targeted a younger generation. Prime Minister Trudeau also knows that he needs to target that generation if he wants to stay in power. So how crucial is courting that millennial vote uh, when it comes to what we're hearing both from the NDP, but most importantly, what we've heard today from the federal government? Yeah, so both the Liberals and the NDP are chasing the millennial and generations that they need the younger voter. That's the demographic that pays off for them uh, electorally. That's, that's the, particularly the millennials is what got Justin Trudeau into power in the first place in 2015. Uh, but According to recent polling over the course of the year, he's lost the support of young people because they're the ones who are pushed out of the housing market. They're the ones who are paying the, the biggest price for affordability. They don't have uh, big investment incomes. They don't have an inheritances. They don't have uh, retirement incomes. And again, they're finding the affordability so hard uh, not to, to crack. And that's why I thought you saw a number of measures in this budget aimed precisely at that demographic. Trudeau and Singh are fighting over the same demographic. And again, it's another reason why Singh's not going to pull support. Yeah, and that's the key to winning these elections is how do you target target specific voters. Keith, we'll have you back in a bit. Thank you so much. But let's go back to Ottawa to continue our reaction. Francis Fong is a senior economist at TD uh, and joins me now. Uh, Francis, thank you so much for doing this. Pleasure to be here, Richard. Just your initial take first as we start here. What, what is your sense of what, what you get out of uh, Budget 2024? Yeah, so obviously we've heard a lot about 
The spending initiatives that this government has put forward, quite a lot of it, $57 billion in new spending uh, over five years. And, uh, you know, obviously a very heavy fo uh, housing focus, but not exclusively. I mean, obviously, if you look at the other areas that, uh, that this government has spent on, national defense, uh, indigenous reconciliation, some productivity initiatives, there have been quite a lot of new spending initiatives which resulted in the need for uh, this new tax measure, the capital gains inclusion rate, uh, above capital gains uh, uh, of 250000 and to be able to afford that and still be able to meet their deficit targets that they set last year. Uh, and so, so quite a lot to go through. And quite frankly, we're all still sort of making sense of what the overall theme and strategy is. Uh, for the years ahead from this government. Yeah, and, and that's obviously a massive challenge always. You look at these huge documents and you boil it down to say, okay, what are the themes here? And I think clearly what's emerging early is this idea of targeting the younger generations, but that in itself has challenges as well. How do you earmark money to ensure that we address complex problems like housing affordability? So when you think about it, I know it's still early days as we dissect the impact here, but what is your sense in terms of themes? And do you believe the government with this budget can be effective targeting that younger generation? It's, that's a really tough question, mainly because I think if you look at what the voters are looking for, they're looking for action now, impact now on rents, on, on sort of ownership affordability. And I don't think there's really much uh, any level of government can do, whether that's municipal, federal or provincial, to be able to have that kind of impact with the speed at which I think people are looking for it. That being said, if we sort of go through with a fine tooth comb all the various measures that they put forth, you know, a lot of focus on, on rental housing through loan programs that we know have had at least an incremental impact on the supply of rental, of rental housing available. Has it had the impact on rents that we would like? No, but I think the kind of additional money that we're, that we're seeing from this government kind of put into this segment of the market will at least move the needle on that front and will impact both rents and vacancy rates over probably a number of years. But I also think that when people are talking about affordability, first of all, it means different things to different people. It really depends on the kind of segment yeah. of the market you happen to be in. When we're talking about the ownership market, which I think is really the, the, the toughest nut to crack that, that I think impacts probably the most people when they're trying to you know, raise a family, get that house and, and sort of uh, launch their life, if you will, that I think we're really seeing the government sort of grasp the straws. There's so many different issues that you need to be able to address that requires federal, provincial and municipal collaboration. You've already been talking about this earlier, talking about uh, the need for additional infrastructure, which we did ultimately see in this budget. Uh, with the federal government tying infrastructure spending to provinces meeting housing goals. Uh, but things like zoning, things like densification, all of these things require a multi-level government approach. And so I think this government is really trying to find partners that are willing to work with them uh, on kind of meeting all these different goals. And that's obviously not always happening. We saw specific reference to fourplexes, and we already know that in the province of Ontario, that's already something that uh, the premier might not be interested in. So there's there's challenges in finding those collaborative partners, and I think that's going to be the core issue, not just the money issue. It's very interesting because here in British Columbia, the Prime Minister has a partner that is ready. And Premier David Eby made a comment earlier today saying, if there are other provinces that don't want Ottawa's money, will take it off their hands because BC is seeing tremendous pressure when it comes to housing affordability and to getting people into their first homes. There's an entire generation that feels they can't afford to live in the neighborhood that they grew up in. The other pressure here, and we're feeling it in BC in so many places, is that of immigration. We are seeing a massive population boom in BC. That's what pressure on the infrastructure you mentioned. Is there enough in this budget that says Ottawa is listening to the concerns of the fast growing provinces and will ensure that if you see a population boom, you get the money needed to boost the infrastructure to support that growing population? 
I mean, Richard, you bring up a good point, and I think we actually need to balance off the housing conversation with the other commitments that this government has made to reduce the number of non-permanent residents as a share of population growth, uh, which should notionally go some way in helping to uh, address the supply-demand balance. But going back to your earlier point about BC being a, a, a sort of a, a willing collaborator, uh, collaborator in this space, you know, that's all well and good, but unfortunately the government has to be able to find collaborators across the entire country, obviously, because population growth is is really strong everywhere. Calgary, for example, strongest uh, population growth across the country that we're seeing right now. And uh, there we might not see the same kind of collaboration or willingness to collaborate in that front. And, and so so while, uh, you know, I can appreciate that in BC and in Vancouver, nowhere in the country do we see housing supply and land availability be bigger issues. Uh, but certainly I think, uh, you know, this government needs to be thinking about all across this country, how do we get sort of shovels in the ground, housing projects built and reach this very aggressive target that they set for themselves, 3.9 million homes uh, over the next seven or eight years. That is a level of construction that we have up to this point never seen in this country. So will we actually get there? I think this, this, the, the sort of housing package that we're seeing so far, it does give them a fighting chance, but there's still a lot of details that need to be ironed out before we really see uh, the needle move in that front. The joys of a budget, finding those specific details. Francis, thanks so much for doing this. It's been a pleasure. Francis Fong is a TD senior economist. There is clearly a big picture here when it comes to the budget. It's not just about money. Here is my colleague and fellow Ottawa Senators fan, Mackenzie Gray. Most of it was already announced, but the Liberals' latest budget, hoping to go hard on housing. We are acting today to ensure fairness for every generation. 8.5 billion in new programs like an infrastructure fund to focus on new rentals, a revamped green energy retrofit package, plus the feds hope to make more federal land available to build on by selling off 50% of their offices. But while housing is the first chapter of the budget, the government actually spent more on defense and indigenous services. They've set a very ambitious target, 3.87 million homes in the next uh, eight years or so. That's a very tough target to reach. It'll require a level of housing construction that we have up to this point in Canada never seen. Outside of housing, the Liberals will implement a $6.1 billion disability benefit to help 600,000 Canadians. They'll change the criminal code to bring in stiffer sentences for car thieves, crack down on concert and sporting ticket fees, and propose a new right to disconnect for federal workers. So you can tell your boss to buzz off after hours. This experience of being always on, uh, of being always available, that's not healthy. It's not a good way to live. To pay for their $57 billion worth of new spending, the Liberals have levied their largest single tax increase in their government's history, raising the capital gains inclusion rate from one half to two thirds for corporations and for individuals whose gains exceed $250,000. Measures set to bring in nearly $18 billion in revenue. Raising taxes in this environment of slow growth, weak investment is, you know, is, is touchy. I think the government you know, wanted to do this additional spending, so they looked at probably what would be the least offensive measures that they could implement. In total, 209 new spending promises, mainly focused on trying to win back Gen Z and millennial voters who've left the Liberals for the Conservatives. Whereas the federal government has long been talking about prioritizing the middle class and those working hard to join it, the promise now to deliver fairness for every generation signals that they see that class has been distorted along age lines. The second largest government expense? Servicing Canada's growing debt, larger than the money the federal government gives to the provinces for health care at $54 billion, a part of a budget that has no path back to balance. Mackenzie Gray, Global News, Ottawa. And some BC representation there. You saw Paul Kershaw from UBC in Ottawa. Uh, let's get some more reaction. Uh, Keith uh, will stick around uh, and we'll comment on what we heard from Pierre Polyev. He has just made his comments uh, in the House of Commons in Ottawa. Did not come outside and take questions from reporters, instead making these comments inside the House. Let's have a listen to the Conservative leader, Pierre Polyev. This is the ninth deficit. The ninth deficit after the Prime Minister promised the budget would balance itself. And what did he do with the money? Everything he spent on has become more expensive. 
He's doubled the rent, doubled mortgage payments, doubled the needed down payment for a home, forced 35 homeless encampments in Halifax alone. One in four kids cannot afford food. And now he's adding $40 billion of new debt and new spending. That's $2,400 of new inflation. That is why Conservatives will vote against this wasteful inflationary budget that poor, that is like a pyromaniac spraying gas on the inflationary fire that he lit. It is getting too hot and too expensive for Canadians, and that's why we need a carbon tax election to replace him with a common sense conservative government. Here we have today an inf a ninth consecutive deficit, with the budget still not balancing itself. And everything on which the Prime Minister spends gets worse and more costly. He is spent and Canadians are broke. The country is broken. We have a doubling of housing costs. We have 8,000 people joining a Facebook group to study how they can get a meal out of a garbage can after food prices have gone up faster than at any time in a generation because of the carbon tax he's imposing on our food. A carbon tax that with the help of the NDP he plans to quadruple to 61 cents a litre. And today, did he learn anything from these catastrophic failures? No. He, he doubles down on the same failure with $40 billion of new deficits, $40 billion of new spending, that's to say $2,400 for every family in new debt and new inflationary spending. And now, for the first time in a generation, we're spending more on debt interest than on health care. That's money for bankers and bondholders rather than doctors and nurses. Right. And the great example of how wonderful government can be Given after a tremendous theatrical pause was the government's purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. What would have happened if the government had just gotten out of the way, asked the finance minister. The answer is the thing would have got built with private money rather than $30 billion of taxpayer bailouts. In fact, a project the prime minister said would cost $5 billion is up to $30 billion. Wow. Mr. Speaker, that is 500% over budget. It is $2,000 in costs for every single Canadian family for a project the private sector was going to be built, building on its own and the company that was going to build it bought out, taking the money to Texas where they're building Texan pipelines with Canadian dollars. All of our exes are in Texas, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> And then, to close it off, we got some of the most hair-raising ideological fervor from the minister, who says that what Canadians really need is a stronger government. <laughs> well, they have created a stronger government to, in order to make for weaker and more suffering people. This is not a government that gives people everything they want. It's a government that takes everything they have. Let's start on the Trans Mountain project. The debate really started here. For those that remember, Premier John Horgan was opposed to the pipeline. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called him into his office in Ottawa alongside Rachel Notley, the then Premier of yeah. Alberta, basically said, get out of the way, BC. And John Horgan said, I'm using every tool in my toolkit here to oppose this project. And what did the Prime Minister did? He bought a pipeline that, as Pierre Polyev just described, is now way over budget from five billion to 30 billion is this something that you believe the federal government is going to wear here when it comes to the cost especially considering that if they were able to maneuver bc this thing was likely going to be built anyways well you know the conservatives aren't on the side of those who oppose the pipeline right. so it, that sort of takes that uh, arrow out of the quiver um, but in terms of, of, of project management the liberals i think are potentially vulnerable because this project literally got away from it. it's like the north vancouver wastewater plant in terms of percentage basis this is a 
even worse. North End was five times the initial cost. This is more than six times the original cost. But we haven't heard much about the pipeline yeah. uh, in recent recent weeks, even though as, as the price continues to escalate, um, it's it's gone away as an issue. And once it starts operating, which is fairly soon, and bringing more shipments, I think that'll diffuse some of the controversy. But it gives Paul a, not a bad talking point. I want to focus in on style here. Often we see opposition leaders come out to speak directly to reporters. Instead, Paul have decided to just do his answer in the House. He had all his MPs around yeah, him cheering and, and supporting him on. What do you make of the decision there uh, for Paul have to stay in the House and not come out to take questions? That fits his style. He doesn't like to meet with the press gallery. He doesn't like to take questions. He likes to control the message and control the environment around him. It's not a bad backdrop for him. I mean, that's going to play on all the newscasts of all his backbencher or his fellow caucus members all clapping for him and such. But again, it allows him to avoid scrutiny and to be asked, well, what would you do? What would you do differently in this? I mean, he did hit some pretty easy, I think, softballs in terms of what wasn't in the budget. He has an impressive array of statistics, you know, 4,500 homeless people in, or camps in, in Halifax and such. So yeah, it's. Uh, but one of the interesting things about the budget today, it projects spending that goes far into the future three to five years, even longer than that. Well, if polls are correct, and there's no reason to think they're not, the guy standing up we just saw is going to be the prime minister after next year's budget. And it means he's not going to be committed to a lot of the spending we saw today. He's going to have diff significantly different commitments than were outlined in the budget today that extend into a time when he may be prime minister. Well, let's continue to get some reaction now out of Ottawa. David McDonald uh, from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives joins me now. Uh, David, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. What do you make of this budget, and is there anything missing here that you were hoping to see from the federal government? Yeah, I mean, this is a go big or go home housing budget. Uh, this was pre-announced, uh, telegraphed last week. Uh, and I think that the scale that we've got in terms of housing spending now is approaching the crisis when it comes to housing affordability in Canada. The tools are in place, I think, now to really give apartment construction, rental apartment construction, a real shot in the arm over the next couple of years. The big danger, of course, for the federal government, as you alluded to just previously, is that this isn't going to be a benefit to this government. It'll be a benefit to the next government in terms of housing affordability whoever that may be. Um, when it comes to other measures that uh, would be of help to regular Canadians, the housing is going to be a couple years delayed. The new Canada Disability Benefit was quite a surprise, despite there being a process in its lead up for disabled Canadians. Uh, there's better support for students in terms of the Canada Student Grant Program. And we're also starting to get a timetable on pharmacare with the federal government actively now going to cover some very common drugs for diabetes and birth control. So these are some, I think, practical things that people can see. One of the other programs that was already rolled out, uh, or is it rather in the process of being rolled out, is $10 a day childcare. In terms of the fees, uh, this program is well underway. In terms of building out the spaces, it isn't well underway. One of the big challenges is wages for ECEs, which remain quite low. Uh, this yeah. budget do, it did have, uh, well, it, it was a fund that was announced previously in terms of loans to open up new child care centers to, to equip them from a capital perspective. Uh, but there was no change in terms of better pay for ECEs, early childhood educators, to actually staff those positions. I think that's a missed opportunity uh, and may imperil the, uh, uh, the survival of this program potentially under a new government. And BC was the leader when it came to $10 a day child care. Uh, we are falling behind here as well because of those challenges that you raise. The other place that BC has been a leader is funding housing and attempting to build that housing. But the reality is finding the people to build the homes has become a challenge. Do you think the government can meet its targets here? Ottawa announces all this money to build housing, to support rentals, but is there a plan here to ensure that that is actually done and done in a way that can address the crisis now? A lot of these federal housing programs are actually copies of BC programs where they were trialed first. I think it's interesting to understand the aggregate uh, impact over the last uh, 18 months or so on the housing market. We've actually seen a big decline in new residential construction in general, uh, and this is due to higher interest rates. And so the folks that used to be building homes are building fewer of them, and so we've seen a fair in decline since February 2022 uh, when we started to see the increase in interest rates. Um, apartment construction's not as affected, but certainly single-family homes, fairly affected. 
And so in terms of finding the people to do that building, uh, there is some more availability, unfortunately, because we're not seeing the same kind of builds on the single family side. Um, there were certainly additional parts of this budget that attempted to deal to some degree with the labor force, but you're right, it's gonna be a challenge. Uh, hopefully we can move those folks across from the single family builds more to the uh, rental construction side where this budget is focused. We know that housing affordability is largely the number one issue for Canadians and, and also cost of living as a whole. How do you measure success here? Canadians look at this budget, they say, look, it's great to have all this new money. What does it do for me? When you're looking at this, David, how do you measure success over the next six months, year to be able to tell that these measures are actually working uh, to address the crisis? These measures won't work in the next six months or a year. That's the big challenge here. I mean, the main things that would change the, uh, the equation in terms of housing affordability is a decrease in interest rates, which the federal government doesn't control, and potentially tighter rent control, uh, which some of the provinces like BC do have. Uh, it's difficult to affect the price level either on housing or food in the short term. Um, you know, and this is really the, the pressure points for Canadians and puts the federal government under the gun. The pieces are in place to make a big impact on rental housing in particular and housing more generally. It's just that they take a while to deliver them and they won't be delivered before the next election. Thanks for doing this. David McDonald there hitting on some of those big issues when it comes to affordability. Keith Baldry joins me again. So we know full well the conversation about affordability and we know the challenges that the government here has had and Ottawa has had in terms of proving that these measures actually work, that they are addressing the crisis. Population pressures have meant that housing prices continue to yep. go up in BC, even though we have seen governments target this specifically. So how do you measure success when it comes to whether the federal government can actually, you know, find that silver bullet when it comes to hitting cost of living and housing affordability? David McDonald made a very good point that we're not going to see much success in six months or a year. It's going to take time and time's running out for the Trudeau government. So he's got to see some, some benchmarks established that he can point to come to the October 2025 vote. And I agree with the, Mr. McDonald that the, the reality is, and we touched about this earlier, there's there's not enough people to build houses and the houses, not enough land to build houses and not enough uh, sort of the municipalities are going to take their time getting in line to build these things. So this is going to take time to solve this. This $3.9 million uh, target is over, I think, seven or eight years. Well, again, the, the sands are, are running out of the hourglass for Mr. Trudeau and his government unless things radically change. So I think it sounds nice. I think people are going to, just like the BC and EP government, is not going to be able to point to much success before the next election in terms of housing. But it sounds like they're doing something. And I think that's the best the Trudeau government can hope for, convincing younger people that at least something's being tried, even though they're not seeing an immediate payoff. All right, we're going to go back to Ottawa now and to continue that conversation around housing affordability. Andrew Graham is the CEO of Borowell and he joins me now. Andrew, thanks so much for doing this. My pleasure. Good to be here. So we know the focus here is about focusing in on housing, uh, trying to find a way to make things more affordable uh, for the generation struggling in this country. Is this budget going to be successful to find the solution that every government is looking for uh, in terms of addressing the housing crisis that's currently happening in this country? Well, of course, it's a very complicated and multifaceted problem. Uh, one thing that we did see in the budget that the Prime Minister had announced, actually the first of the pre-budget announcements a number of weeks ago, the wrong super. was a uh, was a, a ask, essentially urging for a change in how uh, the credit scoring system works, allowing renters to be able to, if they want to, opt into reporting their rental payments, and that would you know, be taken into account when they apply for a mortgage, because it's an unfortunate feature of our system that uh, if you pay a mortgage every month that builds up your credit history whereas if you're a renter perhaps paying the same amount as your next door neighbor paying a mortgage that traditionally has not counted towards your credit score so the budget is urging um, uh, lenders and credit bureaus and companies like mine in fact to work to try to solve that problem so we thought that was uh, you know, expected but positive and then alongside that uh, to make that possible sort of an arcane change, but one that's very important, uh, allowing consumers to share their financial data in a secure way, which is not something that's possible today in Canada. 
but if you want to prove that you're paying your rent, if you're young, a young person wanting to build your credit history you know, with those rental payments, being able to be able to share, that, uh, you know, share your financial data in a secure way, what's called open banking, was also in the budget in a significant way. There was actually a 10-page addendum to the budget outlining how this sort of system would work. The opposition party, BC United, has floated the idea of a rent-to-own program for housing. We expect the government here may bring that into place leading up to the provincial election here in BC in 2024. Do you think there's any merit to the federal government exploring a program to work with the provinces to help people, as you mentioned, not just with their credit score, but to actually help pay down rent that could eventually be applied to a mortgage? Well, it certainly gets to a big problem. Uh, you know, we, we see uh, many, many people every day on our, uh, using our service, go through the first stages of seeing if they'll qualify for a mortgage. And in many cases, if, even if someone has a good credit score and meets that criteria, what they lack is, is the ability to make a down payment. And we know that in places like Vancouver and other you know, expensive cities across Canada, making that down payment to be able to qualify to, you know, to, to get a mortgage can be very, very difficult. So, uh, you know, both parts of that equation matter, you know, building credit history, but also being able to make a down payment matters a lot and programs like Rent to Own, you know, could be part of solving that. Andrew, we're running out of time here, about 30 seconds to a minute left. How do, how do we measure success here? You know, you mentioned work that the companies like yours are doing in this country. How do we measure whether this budget is actually helping with the affordability crunch? Well, look, I think when push comes to shove, uh, we need to you know, have more housing options for more Canadians and we need the price of housing to come down. I'm, I'm you know, continuously uh, saddened by, you know, when I speak to some of the software engineers that work at, at my company, people who get you know, who are very fortunate to be you know, in, in the higher stratas of, of income, certainly for younger people. And when they tell me like, look, there's no way I can afford a house in Vancouver. There's no way I can afford to, build, to buy a house in Toronto. And you know that if people like uh, software developers who are some of the best paid workers in our society, if they can't afford housing in markets uh, like Toronto and Vancouver, then it's gonna be a big problem for, uh, for everyone else. So we need to make sure that there's just more options for people across the income spectrum to be able to find housing um, and build the kind of lives they want. Andrew, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Keith Baldry joins me again. So Keith, we've gone through now, hour and a half post budget. We talked a lot about housing, but one of the big issues that we haven't talked about is healthcare. We know this is a crucial issue for Canadians. Yeah. Uh, in the previous budgets, based on that deal that the uh, provinces struck with Ottawa was a key issue. Do you think this is a side burner issue now, healthcare, or, or is it going to be one of those things where, yes, let's get past the issue of housing affordability, and then day two, day three of this budget, we start saying, well, where's the money for healthcare to ensure that yeah. Canadians get access to the sort of services they rely on? And it really comes down to what the Premier's priorities are. So they've had a big push on a couple of years ago to get that healthcare money. They didn't get anywhere near what they were looking for, but they got a significant amount of money from Ottawa. But the percentage of healthcare funding continues to be in the low 20%. It didn't go up in, in this budget. In fact, uh, our assignment editor, Doug Sodora, pointed out to me that in this budget, debt servicing costs now exceed the federal share of health care funding. So we're paying more to service the federal debt uh, in terms of federal dollars than are going towards uh, health care. But you're right, is, uh, is infrastructure, which we talked about earlier, is that now thrust up, up the list in terms of priorities for premiers who need this money to deal with significant pressures coming from population, which include health care? So health care is not going to disappear as a priority at all. But again, which, which issue is going to get the most attention in the between now and the vote. I think infrastructure is going to rival healthcare when it comes to what the premiers are talking about. We have a minute left. There were a few sort of boutique ideas in here. The fact that your boss is, you know, Doug Sador is another one. He won't be able no, to text no us more, outside Doug. of office hours. I, I think people are going to look at this and be like, come on, is this the sort of policy you want to focus on in the budget? Going after companies like Ticketmaster? Like, are these the sort of things, Keith, that are attractive to voters? Well, again, I think they're attractive to a segment of voters. Sure. And these are younger voters. So, yeah, it doesn't really matter much to a big segment of the population. It doesn't matter to retire 
retirees. It doesn't matter to, uh, to older workers, but it can matter to younger people interested in uh, maintaining a lifestyle, which doesn't mean having the cell phone go off at 10 o'clock at night with your boss. And it does mean accessing concerts and entertainment venues that you want to access without being uh, subject to some really uh, stiff uh, ticketing measures. So again, boutique items are a good way to describe yeah. it. It doesn't affect everybody, but it's a small segment of the population. All right. Thank you, Keith. Right. Thank you for watching us here on our budget special. Obviously, we have lots more news about the budget and everything else coming up after the break here on BC One. Take a good job. Good job. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. good.